Listen, um, for those of you who were here with us last week, thank you for coming back. Okay, uh, I get it. Uh, we were talking last week about what I kind of call body life. It's kind of the reality of uh, just some things that we're looking at, we're processing through because we, we feel accountable, we feel responsible as leaders. We want to be wise stewards of what God is doing uh, and wants to do in and among us financially. And Bill, I don't know if there's a couple slides there, uh, maybe, maybe not, but we talked about some of the uh, building projects that uh, we wanted to do or to complete what we set out to do when Dan Cook came in. And, uh, we just want to finish that out, and that will be coming to you at a later time. But we also talked about um, our annual budget for 2019, and we just said that, you know, if we're going to uh, carry through with the, like, $18,000 that was increased in our budget for this year, uh, it's going to take a little bit more from everybody. And so uh, we, again, have put these cards in your bulletin to uh, remind you that uh, hopefully by the 1st of April or maybe in a couple weeks from now, if not before, you could um, put these in the offering plate or give them to Jennifer or somebody and say, hey, I just want to turn my card in. Uh, and please remember that uh, these are just suggestions that we're giving uh, to you to uh, give maybe an extra, I don't know, what was it, 10, 12 dollars a week which I know adds up, and I get it, that's, that's a lot of money. But here's the bottom line, and Paul reminds us of this in 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Whatever we're giving, he says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsions, for God loves a cheerful giver. You know, we are called to give. It's a blessing to give. It's greater to give than to receive, and so we want to do that. But I understand when we're talking about building projects and we're talking about annual budgets and money and we're talking about children's ministries and reaching out to our community and partnering with our world. I mean, this, there's a lot going on. You know, man, you just keep pushing and pushing, and we're, we're just asking God to lead us. And we're in this together. And we have no hidden agenda. We're just, we're just sharing what God has put in our heart to do and what the society has chosen to do. And we're just, we're just trusting God together on this. This is a journey that we're figuring out as God leads us. And we're trusting Him to show us what's next. And this is helping us to, to kind of clarify what's next. We, we want to live by faith, but we also want to be responsible. And so that's why we're sharing this together. If, if we didn't think that was important, we'd just borrow the money and we'd go into debt and we wouldn't care. But we do. And uh, we're thankful that God has led us this far and he wants to move us forward and we want to be a part of that together. So thank you for that. And, and sometimes when we look at all this stuff, it gets a little overwhelming. But I have a different perspective that I was reminded of. And Kathy, if you come here for a second, Kathy reminded me of something that she said, oh, we were just studying in our Bible class that Sandy Markwood leads on Monday morning. And uh, she shared something with me. I'm like, that's it. That's it. And I had asked her to come and share for just a second what that was so that we could all be reminded of this other perspective. Well, we are studying 2 Chronicles. And in the chapter of 2 Chronicles, it talks about King Jehoshaphat. Sure, you all heard of King um, He was a good king, and he had done great things for the kingdom of Judah, and he had built up an army and he made himself and Judah a, a place to be reckoned with. But one day, uh, he got news that two huge armies were headed toward Judah to destroy them. And he went to the Lord and he said, Lord, I can't do it. We've brought us this far, but we don't have the power or the sources or whatever to handle this huge army that is coming to destroy us. And they prayed, and they asked for God's leading, and um, through a prophet, the prophet said, this is what the Lord has said. And that was mine. All you need to do is show up. Show up. 
and I've got this. And um, so Jehoshaphat went back to his people and his army and he said, put on your armor, <clears throat> put on your battle gear. We're headed to the battleground. And they did. And they marched to the battleground. And when they got there, all they saw were dead bodies because God had come through and he had taken care of it for them. Yeah. And God puts us in situations that he asks us to just show our faithfulness. Be strong and be courageous. That's what he told. That's what he told. <laughs> and when I see that what we have done, I say, we, we all know that God has built this. Right? Yes. And if God has built this, he's not going to leave us stranded. <clears throat> We need money for the building. We need money for a children's director. And we need to stay strong on all of those things that we have said we need in this church. And we just need to show up. God will provide. I, I am so confident that God will provide. And I want you to be strong and courageous. And um, do what you can. The battle will not to God. And he just said, stand back. Amen. That is a good word this morning. And I know the captain has the gift of faith, and that's encouraging. And thank you for sharing that with us uh, today. Hey, listen, as we uh, take the next few minutes, we want to close out this series on the fruit of the Spirit. And we've talked about love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness. And today we're going to be talking about that lovely word, self-control. Those words, self-control. Now, self-control is last. Why did Paul put that last? Maybe because it's the hardest fruit to conquer, part of the fruit to conquer. And maybe it's the longest, it takes the longest to develop. And we're going to be looking uh, into some scripture this morning. Proverbs 16.33 says, Better a patient person than a warrior, one with self-control, than one with the, uh, one who takes the city. See, if we can conquer ourself, we can conquer anything. We're talking about self-control. And just like every other part of the fruit, uh, the good news is, is we don't have to try to conquer this by ourselves, right? This should be called, instead of uh, maybe self-control, it should be called spirit-controlled because this isn't about trying harder or being more disciplined. It's about being reminded that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells within us as followers of Christ and will enable us to develop these things as God sees fit. And these are the foundational things that God said. These are the nine things I want to use in your life and work through your life so that others will come and find me as, as uh, followers of Jesus Christ. So before we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we're going to be looking at this morning, let me give you a definition of self-control. Self-control is making decisions against yourself. Making decisions against your Self. Anyone who has uh, a six-pack abs probably didn't get that by going to the buffet restaurant every night, right? <laughs> they probably got that by going to the gym and doing those all those core exercises that we all love to do. Somebody who has a PhD probably didn't do that by binge-watching television shows every night. They probably figured that out because they were studying and studying hard and accomplishing something big world-class athletes, world-class musicians. Yeah, they're talented and they're gifted, but don't let anybody fool you. There's a lot of hard work in that, and people have made decisions against themselves. So as followers of Jesus Christ, if we're going to grow in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man, if we're going to be able to accomplish all the things that God has created us to accomplish, it comes down to making decisions against ourselves. It comes down to self-control. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Everything about that verse 
has everything to do with decisions against ourselves, resisting temptation, doing things we don't normally want to do, our decisions against ourselves. So the question is, what are some decisions that I have to make that go against myself, those natural tendencies, those things that I would just naturally love to do? Sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes we find ourselves struggling with things that go way beyond the bounds of God's perfect and pleasing will. And we know it. And we have to grab a hold of that truth. And we have to let God help us through those things and give us the empowerment to be controlling ourselves in those ways. Sometimes it's a little harder to figure out. But let's see what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Paul writes, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run? but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to go, as to get the prize. Everyone who completes in the, who competes in the game goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone's running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow in my block to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to, every, to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. I think Paul is saying, listen, if we're going to follow Jesus the way he wants us to follow him, it's going to take a good amount of work. He's saying, let's run for it. Let's go for it. Go big or go home. At the end of the day, it's, it's God's not going to say, well said, good and faithful servant. He's not going to say, well thought or well planned, good and faithful servant. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. What am I doing? And chances are, if I'm doing the things that God wants me to do to accomplish his plans and purpose to stay in step with him, it's going to be doing things that are going to go against myself. Verse 25 says, everyone who competes in the game goes into strict training. In the English Standard Version, it says, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. Paul is likening self-control in the context of an athlete. And we know that athletes train and train and train just to get a slight advantage of their components. I mean, what if we had half the intense intentionality as an, as an athlete, as a world-class athlete had? What if we had that same intensity and that same drive and, and uh, determination to read the Word of God, to worship, to pray, to lead others to Jesus? I think that would be definitely a game-changer. Maybe one of the greatest things that we can do in our spiritual walk with God is to go to the gym. Now, what does going to the gym and our spiritual walk have to do with each other? I find that when I'm disciplined in one area of my life, chances are it's going to spill over into another area of my life. So when I'm going on a food diet, maybe I will be more intentional about looking at my spiritual diet. When I'm working out at the gym and exercising physically, I might be more inclined to exercise my faith. Just something to think about. What we're saying is, if we don't have self-control, chances are it's going to be, our life is going to be out of control. And when our life is out of control, nine chances out of ten, we're going to find ourselves getting in trouble. However, we understand that developing self-control is not a walk in the park, right? Developing that is taking up the cross and denying self. Now, Bill, I have, uh, I'm not going to be reading Philippians 2, 12 and 13. A couple great verses, you could do that. But, but I wanted to go to a different verse that will probably not be on the screen this morning. But the Apostle Paul struggled, right? He was an apostle. He did great, amazing things. The greatest missionary that ever lived. But Paul still struggled with himself, with the things that he wanted to do, with the things that he didn't want to do. Romans chapter 7, verses 
14 through 20. These are the words that Paul writes. He says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do it. All of and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know the good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Sometimes I think Paul writes like Dr. Seuss. You know, it's just like, what? What did he just say? But I'm telling you that Paul struggles, right? And sometimes it's a struggle with sin in our lives that we're combating. We're like, come we've got to get this under control, self-control. There's a fine line between things that we control and things that control us. And if we cross that line and we find ourselves on the other side of it, sometimes it's a lot harder to get back across to the line where we need to be, back in the safety and the boundaries where God wants us to be so that he can use us most effectively. And um, sometimes... It even takes counseling. And I know we have some good godly counselors right here in this congregation, and I'm thankful for that because it's good to talk with somebody that has an objective opinion, but also has a spiritual perspective, right? They can say, hey, so think about it like this. Maybe God's trying to do this in your life. It's easier for self to be in control than it is to try to control ourselves. Just like going to a gym sometimes that we need a spotter to get those last couple of reps in. Sometimes we need a spiritual spot. Sometimes we need accountability in our lives that can help us to, to get back where we need to be. And if we really want to go for it, I know this is radical, but we can always fast. When God is calling us to fast, right? Sometimes fasting puts things in the past. And sometimes when we really go after it and we say, God, I'm serious about this. And I'm going to give up those things that I would normally just do without even thinking about it. But I want to honor you and I want to focus in on what you're calling me to do. That's when we can win some of the biggest battles that we face. And maybe one of the biggest battles that we face is bondage. Right? We're, just, we're just bound up, whether that's spiritually or uh, addictive behaviors. Maybe it's depression, maybe it's anxiety. And God wants to free us from that bondage. In Psalm 327, David writes, You, God, are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I'm confident this morning to say that the God who delivered the Israelites out of the hand of the Egyptians is the same God today that wants to deliver us from whatever we're going through. Amen. That's destroying our lives today. But here's some of the bigger struggle. We talked about this in Sunday school class this morning. Sometimes God delivers us from the evil that we find ourselves in, but we don't take it the next step and set up some concrete disciplines in our lives that help us to stay away from that stuff. And we find ourselves right back into trouble again. 1 Corinthians 10.27 says, All things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. I think someone who has that mindset and that focus and that drive in their life, where they're looking at things, is it beneficial? Is it not beneficial? Go from living an average, mediocre life to someone who has their lives in the hand of God that is seriously helping to move the kingdom of God forward. Do we even bother to ask questions like that? Hey, is this beneficial? Paul talked about renewing of the mind transforms our lives. And he said, so I take captive every thought that I have. Instead of asking the question, how far can I go and still make it to heaven? Right? Maybe we should ask the question, how close can I get to God so that I'm right directly smack dab in the center of his will? 
so that his, his small whisper, right, can grab our attention and go, oh, I'm doing it. I'm going to do that because God's calling me to and we respond with obedience. Beneficial says average isn't good enough. I'm going to go for something better. I'm going to go for that which is beneficial. Verse 26 says, Therefore I do not run like someone runs aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. But we're going to move forward and say, running in a race, running aimlessly, is like running in a race without a finish line. Right? With no rhyme or reason to it. We can't figure it out. It's frustrating. I think what Paul is bidding at here is um, when we're going with God's plan and we don't have things in, in sight that can help us to get from one thing to the next, it's like good luck. So for the next couple minutes that we have together, I just want to talk about briefly three quick things that can help us to focus on self-control. Self Number one, goals. Establish goals. What do goals have to do with Self-control, it has everything to do with self-control because it says that faith is being sure of what we hope for, for and certain of what we do not see. Being sure and being certain. Listen, if we don't have goals in front of us, we're not real sure if we've gotten to the next step and then we don't know where to go next. But if we have goals in mind and we set them before us and we accomplish that goal and we knock that down and we go to the next goal, we know we're moving forward. It's something that's getting accomplished, and it's a great, it's a great thing. We don't want to be aimless. We want to have goals in mind that we're going after. For example, if we're losing weight and we don't have any goals in mind, we're just like, yeah, I'm just trying to lose weight. We don't really think about it. Chances are it's not going to happen. Or if it does happen, we're going to get it right back because we don't have anything that we're aiming for. And it might be a moving target, but at least it's a target. It's important. I think the reason that we struggle sometimes with habitual sins, those things that bind us up, that we become attracted to, and that we become addicted to, is because we don't have anything bigger to say yes to, so that the smaller things we end up saying no to. We need to have a big vision from God that keeps us busy, that keeps us on our knees, that keeps trusting in Him, so all of these other things that we would normally get fixated on and get attracted to, we just say no to that because I have a bigger, I have a bigger vision in mind, right? Paul had a goal. He had his eyes on the prize that moved him forward. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no revelation, people cast off the strict restraint, but blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. King James Version, probably a little bit more familiar to us, without a vision, people perish. The word perish refers to a fruit that is overripe and rotten. In other words, if we don't have a vision, we become rotten. And that's when, that's when Jesus said, listen, I'm going to throw you into the lake of fire because you're not doing anything with your life. Your life is worthless. And my son came and died so that you would live abundantly. We need a vision that goes bigger than us, that is stronger than us stronger than the desires of our flesh. How does that happen? We get into the presence of God, we read His Word, we pray, God reveals Himself to us, and we get filled up with the power of the living God that dwells within us. And we get focused in, and we get zeroed in on what God is calling us to do, and we have a plan, God's plan, as we abide in Him. Number two, establish goals, also establish boundaries. I'm going to be honest with you this morning. It's a lot easier for me to establish goals than it is boundaries. Right? For example, when I know that my family's important, but I see all these great things that are out there, and I say, yeah, I can do that. Oh, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that, too. And it's like, oh, I'll be back. And I'll be back again. And uh, it's hard for me to establish boundaries. But boundaries are important, and sometimes... I need to ask myself the question, okay, what boundary do I need to set? What do I need to reestablish in my life over and over again? And it isn't just setting the boundaries, right? It's defining them and knowing what they are. <coughs> Third and final, 
is to establish routines. Jesus had routines. We see one of these routines out of Mark chapter 1, verse 35. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left his house, went off into a solitary place where he prayed. Some pretty important factors there. Five things that Jesus intentionally did probably every morning. He got up early, while it was still dark. So he got up, he left his house, he went off to a place, and he prayed. He was with his father. Maybe one of the most spiritual things we can do is set the alarm clock a little bit earlier so that we're spending intentional time with God. Maybe it's so that we can help those dreams come into fruition, come into reality. Routine is part of self-control. Routine gives us a rhythm. Routine helps us to take one step in front of another to move us closer to God. Charles Spurgeon was a historian preacher. He was kind of a preacher of preachers. And maybe one of the greatest things he said was, I take my text and I make it, I make a beeline to the cross. I take my text and I make a beeline to the cross. So those nine focuses that we have on the fruit of the Spirit, if you want love, we're reminded when we take it to the cross, that's the love of the world, that he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. If we want joy, the joy of the Lord is our strength when we take the cross. When we take peace to the cross, we understand that the, the cross provides a peace that passes understanding. And when we take patience to the cross, we recognize that the love of God is patient, but it's also kind. So when we take kindness to the cross, we let God be God with kindness. It not only reminds us uh, that God is kind with his love, but it leads us to repentance. And when we think about goodness, no good thing will be withheld hell from those who walk upright with God. And when we think about faithfulness, he will never leave us or forsake us. And when we think about gentleness, and Jesus said, come to me all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Why? Because I am gentle and humble at heart. And finally, when we take self-control to the cross, we recognize that for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-control. Would you stand with me, please, as we close together this morning? God, I thank you that you are so intentional with the lives that you have fashioned. The lives that we're living that you have created us as your masterpiece. That you intentionally brought your son to the world so that he would die and rise again so that we could have everlasting life with you forever but also have a relationship with you here and now. That you were so intentional that said, let me pick nine things that are so important that I want them to be transformed and to be developed in every one of those lives that have chosen to follow Jesus Christ. So that it isn't something that, that we strive for and that we're, yes, we're disciplined for, but God, we know that it's your power that it's work within us that's ever helping us to become more and more like you. And these are the nine focuses that you want us to have so that we could live the life that you call us to live so that we can be that light and hope to people that are looking for something more, something deeper, something different, something that's going to help them to have meaning in their own lives. So God, when we think about these things, help us not to just focus on them of like, oh, I'm just going to try to do that better. But help us to bring it to the cross and ask you to mold that and melt that within our hearts, within our being, so that it becomes the compulsion of who we are and the lifestyle in which we live. Thank you for all that you're doing, God. I thank you for these brothers and sisters that faithfully come here, some that are visiting for the very first time. It says, hey, let's be a part of something more. Let's be a part of something great and foundational that Jesus Christ established 2,000 years ago so that we can do something that honors God, that helps us to become more like him, and helps others come to the cross and turn their life over to God and maybe experience something more for the very first time because of what we're doing, because we're remaining faithful, and because God is faithful to us. Guide us and direct us, God, as individuals. Guide us and direct us as a church because we want to be as intentional 
about the life and the lives that we're living and the lives that we're touching as intentional as you have been for us. To bring us to this point and to help us to move forward. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. If you could stick around and say hi to the Schaefers, that'd be great. If you could stick around and come to the Children's Ministries meeting, you can do that. And if you could stick around and punch something in your in your phone that will remind you to pray on the hour every hour, that would be awesome for Teens for Christ and the Missions Ministry. God bless you. Thank you for being here.